in this video we're going to be exploring my current loop microphone project. This project originates back from about 1999 when I was working on this reality TV slash internet streaming project called We Live in Public. And the idea of We Live in Public was to create a complete surveillance environment with both audio and video that would stream live on the internet. So we started designing the system and it was going to be automated. So we had motion sensors that would trigger from different scenes that were set up. So you have a camera angle and a microphone in a certain place. And it would then all automatically edit this thing together 24 hours a day. So looking at the problem, we had this audio and video matrix switcher that was going to select which feed, whether it was audio or video, and always choose the closest microphone to where the action was. It's the best way to get the great sound. It's like having a guy that's following you around, but instead you just use a ton of microphones. So to do this, we, we wanted to get the best sound possible. So we called in this well-known audio guru guy, and he looked at the problem, and he came up with this incredibly expensive proposal, which was to use these really expensive microphones that were fed through this super fancy Belden triple shield crazy cable that was really expensive. It was also really big and really awkward. And remember, we had to wire all this stuff through walls and under floors and behind things. So it was going to be a nightmare. And the, the proposal came out to be around $40,000, which is like more than $1,000 per microphone. And that didn't even include the installation of the wiring. So I had to really take a step back and look at this and think like, there's got to be a better way we can do this. The smartest thing we could do would be to somehow use the cheapest kind of wiring possible, like Cat5 cable. Like a Cat5 cable has four pairs in it, so you could theoretically run four microphones through one Cat5 cable, and that would allow you to simplify and clean up the wiring dramatically. You could use, you know, punch down blocks and all the simple sort of telco slash network cabling technologies that are cheap and easy. And you can just hire a, a network cable in installer and have them do it in an afternoon or two or three. So I basically thought like it should be like a, an old fashioned wired telephone. And an old fashioned wired telephone is basically a current loop. It's self powered, it's totally floating. And as you may remember, they sounded pretty good. They had very low noise and it worked great. So the current loop concept was the way to go. We basically raise the signal level up high enough so it's above all the normal millivolt nastiness that you get with microphones and move that signal as a current through this very cheap unshielded cable. So that ended up being the solution. I designed these little boards, both a transmitter and a receiver, and they ended up costing maybe around $150 per microphone, and it worked great. The rest is history. The block diagram for this device is relatively simple, but I like the clarity of making no assumptions. So looking at this, you can see we have two function blocks. There's the transmitter, which has the microphone, and the receiver, which has a power source and produces an audio output. Connecting these two devices is a two-wire interface. These wires can be really, really long. You could easily run this through about a thousand feet of cable with no problem. There's really no special requirement for this wire. It could be unshielded, it could be thin wire, it could be thick wire. The only real limitation is the total voltage drop of the system, but there's a lot of tolerance built in for that. The current flowing in the wires provides two basic functions. It powers the circuitry in the transmitter unit and also conveys the audio information back to the receiver. The level of current in the loop is controlled by the transmitter. At idle, when there's no audio present, this current is around 37 milliamps. This represents 
half of the maximum current that the current source can produce plus the quiescent current of the voltage regulator and the op amps. This quiescent current determines the absolute minimum current that can ever flow in the loop. The sound picked up by the microphone modulates this current flow. It should stay neatly centered between the maximum and minimum current levels. This represents the dynamic range of the system. If we exceed the dynamic range, we get clipping. This occurs when the signal is greater than the maximum or minimum limits of our system. Here's the schematic for the transmitter section. Let's take a closer look at this first from a function block point of view. Starting at the input, we have an RFI filter, or radio frequency interference filter. Then moving on, we have a 5 volt regulated power supply, an unused op amp, and down here we have the bias generator and microphone circuitry. That feeds into two AC gain stages, and finally the voltage controlled current sink, which modulates the current on the loop. Looking back to our input section, First we have our RFI filter. It's designed to attenuate differential mode radio frequency crap that we're going to inevitably pick up on our long wires. It's got a cutoff frequency of about 200 kilohertz. This then feeds into the bridge rectifier D1. This makes the circuit polarity insensitive so we don't have to worry about how we connect the wires. Next we have a simple 3 terminal 5 volt regulator which creates the power supply for the op amps. These regulators require a minimum value of input and output capacitance to remain stable and happy. R1 serves to decouple this large input capacitance from our audio current. If it wasn't there, all of the higher frequency audio would be shunted to ground by C3's low impedance. And floating off in the corner here we have our unused op amp. It's always a really good idea to take any unused op amp in your design, turn it into a voltage follower and ground the input. This prevents the output from wandering around or even worse, breaking into oscillation, which could induce noise in other parts of your circuit. Just keep it neat and tidy. The electret capacitor microphone module that we use requires a DC bias. This bias must be really, really quiet. That's why we decouple it with this RC network consisting of R5 and C8 first. Then the signal on R8 is AC coupled through C9. Next we have a bias voltage generator that creates a very stable and quiet 2.5 volt reference for the rest of the circuit. This voltage is fed through R7 into the op amps to bias the rest of the chain. The signal now entering the amplifier chain is a 2.5 volt DC level with a millivolt audio signal from the microphone superimposed on top of it. The two cascaded non-inverting amplifiers provide a minimum gain of about 100, which can be increased by turning the potentiometer. Capacitors C6 and C11 in the feedback networks of these amplifiers cause the gain to roll off to 1 at DC. This allows the 2.5 volt DC level to pass straight through without being molested. Capacitors C5 and C10 help to roll off the gain well above audio frequencies. This helps to keep the overall system quiet from higher frequency noise. The output of amplifier U1B therefore becomes a large voltage signal that can vary between 0 and 5 volts, but it's normally centered on 2.5 when there's no audio signal present. The amplifier U2B along with Q1 and R10 form a classic voltage controlled current sink. The voltage signal coming in is compared to the feedback voltage across R10. The op amp servos Q1 to maintain those at equal voltages. The current required for the voltage drop across R10 has to come from the external current loop. And that's how we drive the current loop with a precise replica of the audio signal. If we do the math, we can take the reference voltage of 2.5 volts and divide that by 82 ohms. That gives us a current of about 30 milliamps. Now I can already hear everyone asking, why is it 30 milliamps? Well, like everything in the real world, it's a bit of a compromise. If you think about it, the higher the current level is, the higher up out of the weeds we are. Our signal to noise ratio should be better. 
but we do pay the penalty of power dissipation. At a certain point, this thing is just gonna get way too hot. Down at the low end of the current range, we have a totally different problem. The cable capacitance plus the capacitance in our input filter forms a low pass filter with our current sink. To get the bandwidth we need out of this, we need to have a high enough current level so the current sink can really push that capacitance around fast enough to get those higher frequencies. Now let's move on to the receiver portion of the current loop system. What's cool about this is the receiver contains no active components whatsoever. It's only got resistors, capacitors, and two transformers. Yet it does its job really well. The output of the receiver is an electrically floating line level signal. Since it's electrically floating, you can connect it to a balanced audio system or a single-ended ground reference system with ease. There should be no ground loops or other issues like that to contend with. That's the beauty of a floating output. The AC currents that are flowing through the two 50 ohm resistors generate AC voltage drops. These AC voltages are capacitively coupled into two coupling transformers, T1 and T2. These are wired in aiding fashion so that the voltage at the output is equal to two times the voltage across the individual resistors. This configuration generates large output voltages from the differential currents flowing through the transmitter. But for common mode currents, such as the current that's created from AC line voltages coupling into the two long wires, the transformers buck or oppose each other to cancel these voltages. So basically we end up with a high differential mode sensitivity and a very low common mode sensitivity, which is exactly what we need for this system. So how far could we potentially run this crazy thing? Well, there's two limitations. The first one being DC voltage drops. The current setup running from a 24 volt power supply can withstand about 200 ohms of loop resistance. If we assume 24 gauge wire, that's a round trip of about 1.2 kilometers before we hit 200 ohms. That's pretty good. The easy fix for these voltage drop limitations is just increase the supply voltage. But be careful not to exceed the maximum input voltage of the voltage regulator and the power transistor on the board. The second limitation is really cable capacitance. And that's not gonna give you a hard fail. It's just gonna give you more and more high frequency attenuation as the cable capacitance increases. When I was playing around with LT Spice modeling all this stuff, what I was shooting for was getting a 20 kilohertz overall bandwidth through a thousand meters of Cat5 cable. That ends up being about 52 nanofarads of capacitance. And it, this design pretty much makes that happen. So what happens when you inevitably short out those long current loop wires? Well, the maximum current that can flow is about quarter of an amp and those resistors, if you put three watt resistors in there, will just sit there and get warm. So it's kind of inherently fail safe for short circuits. But as I think about it, I should put some kind of voltage clamping network on the audio output. Because when you short it out, there's going to be a pretty nasty transient on the audio output that could blow something up. Got to fix that. The op amp that we've chosen for this project is the LME49721. It's kind of an ideally suited part for this job. There's a few very important features that we have to be on the lookout for. Firstly, we need a rail-to-rail -rail input and output voltage range. Because we only have 5 volts to play with, we want to make sure that we get the most out of the dynamic range of our system. Some op amps can't swing their outputs all the way to the supply rails, nor do they work correctly when their input voltages are close to the supply rails. What this means is you can't use those little voltage ranges so you lose dynamic range. We also need a nice low quiescent operating current. If this thing draws too much current, it starts to become a large proportion of our output signal, and that's not good. We also want a high PSRR, or power supply rejection ratio. Since our power supply voltage is derived from a DC voltage with audio on top of it, we've got to be able to reject any audio signal that ends up sneaking through on the 5 volt rail. 
We need a high gain bandwidth product. We also need a high slew rate. This just means the op amp is fast enough to keep up with our input signals. And finally, we need low input noise density and low THD or total harmonic distortion. Since this chip is really designed for precision low noise audio applications, it does all that stuff really well. Don't get sucked into thinking that just because you spec'd out this super low distortion, low noise, super fancy op amp that your circuit is going to sound great. It doesn't work that way. Most of what matters is the actual circuit design itself. The op amp helps, but if you don't get the design part right, the circuit will just drown in the noise that comes from all the other little design mistakes that you made. Sadly, after 20 years, this photo is all that remains as evidence of the original system. This board was a four-channel receiver. On the left, you can see the RJ45 that connected to the CAT5 cables. On the right side, there's four RCA jacks for output. The 24-volt power supply connects to that little blue terminal strip along the bottom edge. Arguably, installing this kind of wired surveillance system is a total pain in the ass. You gotta run physical wires. But once you get it installed, it'll provide you with decades of crystal clear, totally undetectable surveillance that no bug detector of any kind will ever find. You'd be surprised how much unused cabling there is in the typical building. There's old telephone wires, network cables, and even coax from cable TV installs all of which can be put to use. Even if a telephone cable or an ethernet cable is in use, there's often spare pairs in the cable that aren't utilized. So there's actually quite a lot of opportunity for sneaking this kind of technology in if you're a little bit clever about it. So the whole multi-million dollar bug detector industry is predicated on the construct that all bugs must transmit RF. So therefore, no RF, no bug. You can rest easy. But clearly, what a load of crap that is. A very low-tech solution gets around that, and there's no countermeasures that can detect it, short of just ripping the whole place apart, which is the only way you could ever really be sure. Check one, two, take five. So if you all enjoyed the journey that we just took together, if you learned something, you got value out of this, give me some value back. Click that like button, subscribe, and leave copious comments below. Thank you all very, very much.